in this video, we are going to explore what science is um, before we dive into the chemistry that we're going to learn throughout our quarter. Uh, and in this lecture, what I hope to address is what is science and, and what is scientific? Um, so that way we can critically evaluate uh, scientific claims, be they in chemistry or medicine or physics or something we're coming across in our daily lives. And hopefully learning how to critically evaluate scientific claims will help us learn how to write them. Uh, in this class, we're going to need to learn how to communicate science and scientific findings and doing that in a way that is easy for others to understand and that provides evidence is a, a key foundational skill to uh, becoming a scientist. So let's start off. Uh, with a, a general welcome to chemistry. Uh, so we are going to be really looking at the science that understands or seeks to understand the behavior of matter. Uh, and to do that, we're gonna study atoms and molecules. To study matter, though, we're also going to need to study energy. And we will dive into this um, as we start the actual content of this course related to chemistry. Um, I share this picture because to me, uh, chemistry always has the risk of explosions and that's an extremely exciting piece of the science behind it, that we can combine atoms and molecules in a way that has really spectacular results uh, or dangerous results as well. So let's focus on that word science that we see here. So if chemistry is a science, let's start at the very basics with what is science. Now, we've been exposed to this already. You're here in a college class, you've had science before in school, and you're exposed to it every single day. And we make decisions based on science in our daily lives. And we observe or participate in or push for policy changes and laws that are based in science. Uh, and this is a smorgasbord of uh, images around things that I feel are part of my everyday life um, that are connected to science and not necessarily science that I know well. I do not know much about insects, like I am not an entomologist, yet I do think a lot about murder hornets now. I also do not. Uh, have a, a background in studying viruses, but I think a lot about COVID-19 every single day. I also think a lot about climate change, which I feel I know a bit more about than insects or viruses, and yet there's a wealth of information that I'm not an expert in. And yet I navigate opinions and policy decisions and make choices based on the science that others do and others are experts in. And so it's important to be able to critically evaluate the information that I'm processing as I seek to be an informed citizen. And so that's why I think that science and science communication is a critical component of a general chemistry class. Uh, scientific argumentation is something that we're going to do based on the results we see out of our labs or while we're evaluating uh, complicated problems in class, but creating a scientific argument or claim or statement goes way beyond my chosen field of chemistry. Um, and since it's used to form public opinion, science is used to form public opinion, and then to create public policy, we need to be able to critically evaluate uh, and, and understand the evidence and scientific reasoning that is being presented to us. And so we're going to develop scientific literacy skills in this class alongside with learning chemistry, and they go perfectly hand in hand. Uh, so you'll get practice uh, communicating uh, scientific claim and supporting it with evidence and connecting that evidence to the claim with scientific reasoning. Uh, you'll also get practice evaluating claims that use scientific evidence and reasoning. And then I'd like you to start also getting comfortable with responding to scientific claims that you disagree with in a constructive manner that is, again, founded on or based on evidence. So um, I have a, a link to recommended reading and there will also be a, a PDF of this on our Canvas page. Um, 
but it's, it's a short kind of document called Making Sense of Science Stories, or I Don't Know What to Believe. And it's a, a very helpful um, source of information about how to navigate all of the scientific claims that we are presented on a daily basis and how to evaluate them and the, some of the questions to start asking as information is presented to you as uh, fact or as uh, evidence. So I, I, I think it's also important to start at what is science and what, what is scientific? Um, and I love this checklist of how scientific is it? Because like a lot of things we'll discuss in this class, there's kind of a spectrum. Um, and so since science is difficult to define very precisely, um, we have this kind of checklist to think through how scientific something is. Um, in general, science is a human activity. Um, and it leads to like the development of really interesting technology, but it also is based on understanding how we make decisions and analyzing our behavior as well. And so here's, uh, here's our how scientific is it checklist. And this is um, coming out of uh, UC Berkeley. So focuses on the natural world. So science is understanding the natural world around us. And in chemistry, the, the sliver of the natural world we look at is the behavior of matter. And so if something is scientific, it, it needs to focus on the natural world. It should then aim to explain the natural world or phenomenon within it. It'll need to use testable ideas. And this is kind of the foundation of science for me, that we have ideas that we can test. And then it relies on evidence. We don't make a claim without having evidence to support that claim. There's a reason that we make a statement about the natural world. And this is also my favorite part, that something is scientific only when it involves the scientific community. Science isn't done in isolation, uh, not in a bubble. It is a community effort. It is the human race moving forward with our understanding of the world around us together. And so that means that any testable idea I test and develop evidence for isn't really scientific until I put it to the scientific community and have other people critically look at it, try to get the same result um, and, and, and confirm it or confirm its uh, reasonability through essentially peer review. Um, and next one is that it leads to ongoing research. In science, if you ask a question and you go to test it and you design an experiment to answer that question, you usually answer that question with four more questions. And it keeps going and building. Anything new we learn opens up our understanding of the natural world a little bit more, and that should just lead to more questions. And so it's an ongoing process that never ends. And lastly, there's benefits from scientific behavior that we we uh, see a benefit to the testable idea in the research that it's, this is an exploration to benefit our understanding and our daily lives. So let's apply this checklist uh, to something. Let's look at crystal healing. So I have a video link here. Please pause this video and give it a quick watch. It's four minutes long and it's a natural practitioner explaining uh, kind of an, an introduction to crystal healing. Now, this is not a doctor of naturopathy. Uh, this is a natural practitioner. So they, they are not a doctor of medicine. All right. Hopefully you've had a, 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 taken a few minutes to pause this video and watch the, the, the video on crystal healing. Um, and so in some ways it seems scientific. Um, in the video, she discussed the solid state structure of different elements and minerals. And that was uh, something we'll discuss in chemistry 163. And, and it wasn't inaccurate. The way atoms are aligned will stay constant and next to each other. And there's forces that hold them together and interactions that then become permanent in the actual crystal structure of that solid. Um, but then there's also medical knowledge presented in the video about physical and mental disease states, though the question is, are they actually linked together? Um, 
and so the claim is that there is uh, a, a healing property to these solid state structures. And so let's walk through our science checklist and, and see how scientific crystal healing is. So first off, does it focus on the natural world? Yeah, crystals are solid materials of atoms. They're matter, just like chemistry. This is a focus on the natural world. It's also a focus on the health of a human body. Um, and so it's the biology of the human body. And it's also the solid state structures of materials. So we've, okay, let's do a check mark. So we have a focus on the natural world. Um, does it aim to explain the natural world? Hmm. Now that's when I would pause and a question because the, the use of crystal healing is taking advantage of something natural and applying it to a medical problem. Uh, but it's not actually explaining how crystals heal a human body. And there isn't an aim to explain that, rather to take advantage of it, um, from the video at least. Does it use testable ideas? Now that's another one, that's a question. Um, anecdotes were definitely given and personal experience around the crystal healing properties. And if, if you go dive a little bit deeper into this, there isn't actually any scientific literature in, in a published journal that's peer reviewed about uh, an idea about crystal healing that can be tested. Oh. And so, uh, and while there, it, there might be some out there, uh, please send them my way if you find them. Um, I'd say that there is a lack of testable ideas that are being used in this practice. So does it rely on evidence? That's another one. And you might, you, we might have different opinions on this. You could say that the personal healing journeys of patients that have positive experiences with crystal healing as evidence. Now, if that evidence is collected in an anecdotal way, is it as strong a piece of evidence as uh, if it is collected through a scientific study, like a double blind study? So that's a questionable one as well. Does it involve the scientific community? Now that one, it does not. Um, because this is, it, it involves a community of practitioners, but it is not something that is actually studied in the chemistry literature. Uh, does it lead to ongoing research? Again, this is not something we see because we don't have a testable idea that is producing evidence that can then lead to uh, further tests along the way. It's not aiming to explain anything, rather it's aiming to heal people. Um, are there benefits from scientific behavior? We could say there are benefits to crystal healing if we have people that are um, improving their health, then we have a benefit to the human race in that sense. So looking at this, I would say that crystal healing is not something that is going to be classified as scientific. And in the video, that I, I at least observed that there was the presentation of information that is based in science, like the structures of crystals, but that it's not actually connected through evidence or testable ideas to the benefit, which is uh, healing disease states um, or relieving symptoms. And so that connection between the two seems to be missing. And that's the piece that makes this not, not as scientific. Um, that and its lack of involvement of peer review through the scientific community. So a uh, video that I recommend you watch when thinking through this question about what is science is a Bozeman science video called The Nature of Science. Um, it's a little bit longer, it's about eight minutes and it really walks through what science is and, and how we approach scientific thinking. Um, and, and it really boils down to this idea of testable ideas. Um, and that is our foundation of what science is. It's something that you can test. Um, and that's really what a hypothesis is. A hypothesis is an idea that you can test. And by testing it and collecting evidence through observation, we can increase our confidence in our explanation. Um, and that can lead to further testing. And it's, it's very circular, this process of science, and that a testable idea will lead to um, will be caused by exploration and discovery, but it will create more questions that'll lead to further exploration and discovery. 
We also have testable ideas that lead to benefits and outcomes and that sometimes those benefits then lead to more ideas to test. And we also have community analysis, so that, that scientific community peer review and feedback and the bringing together multiple minds on any one idea. And so these testable ideas can be impacted and improved and then lead to new ideas to test by peer reviewing our work. And all of these are connected and it keeps going in this cycle. We keep testing ideas and refining and testing and refining with input from our community, evaluating the benefits, and then also just moving forward towards a general understanding of our natural world and exploring and discovering new things, which then lead to more and more ideas that need to be tested along the way. Um, and so here is actually thinking about the scientific approach of not to knowledge, a kind of an outline of this process in a way. Uh, and again, I have another, another great video to watch alongside this. Um, and that is the Amoeba Sisters' Casual and Scientific Use of Theory and Law, um, which is really talking about how we, uh, in our daily lives, use these words in a not very scientific way. And that when we use them in this science class, we are going to use them in their most scientific meaning. And so that there might be a disconnect between these two. So in general, kind of this process of uh, like building our pool of scientific knowledge, it, it, it starts with observation and it starts with curiosity of our natural world and trying to explain what is around us. And from our observations or what we notice or what we're interested in, we can then form a hypothesis. And I, I think I already said this, but I'll say it again. Um, and this is straight from Dinosaur Train, but a hypothesis is an idea you can test. Um, and so from that hypothesis, that testable idea, we can make predictions. And set expectations. If we do this, we expect B. If we do A, we expect B. And so as we perform an experiment to test that idea, then we'll make more observations. And it might not support our hypothesis at all. And that'll send us back to the drawing board. Well, okay, well, now that we have more observations, what, what do we really think the explanation is now that we know more information? And sometimes, and so that's how we get this cycle here occurring. And then sometimes our experiments really support our hypothesis. And when they're consistent with that prediction, then we're contributing to a body of knowledge that uh, is on this um, point of curiosity that we're exploring. And sometimes further testing beyond that doesn't really support it and we go back and we're constantly refining in a loop here as well. There's lots of loops in scientific um, approaches to knowledge. So as we build up more knowledge, as we see observations again and again and again that are consistent with our hypothesis, um, we start to develop laws and theories. So our observations um, are going to lead to laws. Our laws are going to be consistent observations. If we observe the same thing over and over and over, it will become a law of nature. Whereas um, our hypothesis, our testable idea, as we make more and more observations that support that hypothesis, it becomes a theory. Um, and so this is a well-supported <laughs> hypothesis. So as we build up a large body of knowledge that supports this idea, this testable idea or explanation of something we see in the natural world, an observation that started this all off, then we develop a theory. And so hypotheses when, uh, well supported with evidence become theories and observations that we see again and again and again consistently become a law. So as science happens in our, in our world, um, as that body of knowledge gets larger and larger and larger, we use that body of knowledge to make decisions in our lives. Um, and as a society. And so as we just navigate daily life, we're constantly confronted with scientific arguments and claims. And so 
I'd like to now talk about how to critically evaluate those claims and decide if an argument is strong or weak. Um, and so in general, a scientific argument can kind of be broken down a few different ways. One is to say that uh, a scientific idea, so it's an attestable idea or hypothesis, um, plus expectations. So if I believe my explanation is X, I would expect Y to happen in my testable idea if I ran an experiment. And then if my observations support that expectation, it creates a scientific argument. And so it's really together that those expectations and observations that support a scientific idea formulate that overall scientific argument. And I'll call this scientific argument or scientific claim or scientific statement throughout this class. Um, so let's just take a quick example. Here's a scientific idea that illness in new mothers is caused by doctor's dirty hands during the birth of their child. So if this is my scientific testable idea, I would expect that illness rates should go down if we require doctors to wash their hands before attending a birth. So let's test that idea. That experiment happens. We start requiring some doctors to wash their hands. We have a control group where they do not. And then we, we observe the illness rates between these two groups. So when this test was actually performed in the 1800s, the observation was that our results matched expectations. Illness rates decrease when doctors were required to wash their hands when attending a birth. And so that observation supporting that expectation supports the scientific idea that was testable. And together, these make a strong argument. Now, we can always question the strength of the study and of the evidence. Was this just testing a doctor with one patient and then another doctor with another? Or did it test uh, hundreds of doctors or thousands of doctors over a period of time? We'll save that for a minute. So when we're evaluating scientific claims in general, um, there's a few things that we kind of want to consider and evaluate for each one of these. Um, so a scientific idea, which is also a claim, we can call this, um, in general, when we see this, the question that I always ask when presented with a scientific idea or claim or statement is, is it a testable idea? And not all ideas are testable. Um, and so it needs to be grounded in something that we can observe. It has to create an expectation that could be tested and observed within the natural world. And so for any scientific idea, is it a testable idea? Now, uh, in terms of expectations, expectations is really going to be the, the scientific reasoning, in my opinion. If this scientific idea is true, then I expect to see this. It's, it's my kind of link to my observations, which are really my evidence. And so when I'm evaluating reasoning and evidence or expectations and observations, um, let's talk about evidence first. The questions that I tend to ask are, what is the amount of evidence provided in this argument? And what is its overall strength? and objectivity. So any piece of evidence I'm kind of evaluating on a few different points, like what, how, how large is the body of evidence to support this idea? Uh, how strong is that evidence? Is it, can I see holes in how it's being interpreted or how the study was done? How objective is it? Um, and a lot of that has to do with experimental design. And then for my scientific reasoning and my expectation that's kind of like linking these observations with the scientific idea, the questions I usually ask are, is this logically sound to me? Is there a real connection between this expectation and the scientific idea? But also, what is the, the response of the scientific community? Was this peer reviewed? Was this not peer reviewed? Is this something that was done in isolation or was it done in collaboration with a larger scientific community? 
And so that's sometimes through peer reviewed journals. Um, sometimes it's just through a response of like other, other groups or scientists testing the same idea in different ways. And so these are kind of the ideas that I'm, uh, these are the questions I'm asking whenever I'm evaluating something that's presented to me as a, a scientific argument. And so let's explore a little bit more around this um, way of evaluating evidence. Um, so th there's this phrase, it's scientific certainty or certainty. How certain am I that this evidence is supporting the scientific idea? How certain am I that this scientific idea is sound? Um, and there's a few ways that we can evaluate evidence that allows us to feel certain or not. Um, and again, this is what we just said before. It's the amount of evidence the strength of the evidence and the objectivity of the evidence. And that's what leads us to an idea of scientific certainty. And when we're very certain, we have laws and theories. And that means we have a large body of evidence that is strong and objective supporting our idea. And when we have very little certainty, we really are working off of just an observation like a personal set of observations. And so we have kind of a, a, a range here of different kind of levels of certainty. And we'll talk about the language around certainty in the next slide. Um, so let's evaluate each of these three components that lead us to scientific certainty. First, amount of evidence. Um, and so this is something that while you're reading, you can kind of, you can kind of get a feel of. Is there just one observation made and that's the evidence cited? Like, is it just one? You know, my friend uh, Heather was uh, had a really bad eczema until she started using crystal healing and it cleared right up. Uh, that's just one example. Therefore, it's, uh, you know, sound medical treatment plan. It's, it's just one observation, so it's a low amount of evidence. But an overwhelming amount of evidence would be a series of studies done by multiple different scientific groups on a large subset um, of a population and with rigorous kind of controls around it. So lots of evidence rather than just one observation. Now that strength of the evidence is also important to evaluate. Um, now, if multiple pieces of evidence are presented, but they're unrelated, it's not a very strong argument. Um, and then we can kind of go up, like we can think about just a classroom experiment done by a novice scientist. It's not gonna be a very strong piece of evidence because we don't have the experiment being performed necessarily by someone with a great amount of experience in the field. But you know, as we think about the strength of evidence, we should look at the, the way the experiment was designed. Are there any loopholes? If, if it's well designed and no loopholes, but there's just one single line of evidence, we usually think of that as kind of in the middle for strength. But if it's well designed, there's no loopholes, there's no kind of like glaring emissions, and there's multiple lines of evidence, which means that the idea is tested in multiple different ways. And all of those different types of evidence all support the same idea. Um, that is a really strong argument in that case. And then there's objective and subjective evidence as well. Uh, subjective might be something that's anecdotal. Like I think when I held a crystal to my heart, it helped me um, deal with a heart arrhythmia, you know, um, versus something that's objective that maybe we can actually measure and reproduce as well and have other groups reproduce rather than just me. And so it's everyone with a heart arrhythmia when they hold this one crystal to their heart see an improvement. And so when scientists are trying to communicate how much certainty they have, um, they're, they're showing that they, it's like you can read for that amount of evidence, strength of evidence and objectivity. Um, and so we have confidence terminology and likelihood terminology. So if there's a very high level of confidence, then we're really saying that there's a nine out of 10 chance of being correct. Um, and a very low confidence would be one out of 10. And so we kind of have these general benchmarks for confidence right here in this kind of percentile sense. 
Um, and then also thinking about likelihood. If we're virtually certain something is happening, that is a scientist saying 99% probability that it's 99% of the time this will occur. Uh, extremely likely is on the 95%. Let's go to 50%. Uh, more likely than not just means more than half the time uh, that the, it will occur. Unlikely is at 33%. Uh, and then exceptionally unlikely is at less than a 1% chance of occurring. And so these are kind of terms that we use to really, that are actually linked to very specific probability benchmarks. Um, and so when you're reading in the scientific literature, these are great cues for understanding uh, sometimes how a large body of evidence is summarized and presented in like introductions or discussions of scientific papers. And then if you dive deeper into their results, you should see this uh, as well in terms of like the actual numbers that they're reporting. So now I'd like to explore the objectivity of scientific evidence a little bit more. Um, and this one is a little bit uh, less direct or measurable. Um, so follow along with me on this. First, don't look anything up. Don't pause the video. Just off the top of your head, make a guess. What is the most popular movie of all time? Like all time. And it, you're going to have to draw on personal experience or things maybe you know or don't know or movies that you liked the most. Um, so first, without thinking or looking anything up, so please think, but what's the most popular movie of all time? Write it down because we're going we're gonna to add evidence to this and see what happens. All right, so now consider the data on this table and decide what is the most popular movie of all time. Um, and so this is looking at lifetime gross income of box office ticket sales. Um, and it's showing the movie, the studio, and the year, and the amount of money that that movie has made over its lifetime. And we see here at the top, if we're just going by box office numbers, it's Star Wars The Force Awakens. Made a lot. So take this data. Think about what's the most popular movie of all time, write it down. All right, so after I've looked at this, I'm like, oh, well, I mean, if it makes the most money, the most people saw the movie, that seems like popularity. I'll, sure, Star Wars is the most popular movie. I guess it's not my first guess, which was Totoro, but you know. Now let's look at some a, a different set of data and ask ourselves the same question. What is the most popular movie of all time? Now, consider we just saw the most, uh, the largest gross income was for the Star Wars Force Awakens movie. But now if we adjust the gross income for inflation, and again, these are just box office ticket sales, but this is adjusted for inflation, we see that Gone with the Wind actually is the top grossing movie of all time based on box office sales when we adjust for that, that, that inflation over time. And Gone with the Wind came out in 1939. This forever ago. A dollar went a lot further than it does now. It did not cost like $15 to go see a movie. So then we see Star Wars, just Star Wars, not The Force Awakens, comes in right after that at, at uh, 1.6, I guess that's billion something something, uh, in 1977. All right, so looking at this information, you now might be inclined to say, oh, well then I guess it's gone with the wind, right? Let's adjust. So we are comparing apples to apples rather than uh, not adjusting for inflation. And all right, cool, now it's gone with the wind. Or maybe you've got a different argument. All right, now consider this. What's the most popular movie of all time? And looking at 1939, there were only a 1,700 feature films released. But more recently in 2015, there were over 10,000 feature films released. So as time progresses and more movies are released each year, then or more the number of movies that have been released increases, then does popularity be, a, is that affected? Is it a movie more popular if it has more competition and still is seen a great deal and makes a lot of adjusted income. So now, so first think about the, ev the evidence given to you, the different pieces of data and decide what 
you think makes the most popular movie of all time? Which pieces of information are important when evaluating that? Now, if you've got that, think about, all right, so now you have an opinion about what is the most popular movie. Consider what pieces of information did you weigh and was one of those pieces of information more important and so weighted more than another one? And if you're making that decision to weigh information more than another piece of information while making this decision, are you really interpreting the data objectively? Is it, is it possible to take a large several sets of data and create an objective interpretation of it to develop an idea of what the most popular movie is? And even if you think that's possible, given the information that you have, now I've got to ask, are there other pieces of information that you need to really formulate an objective opinion or an opinion in general? What is missing that you're not considering when evaluating popularity of movie? So far, we've just looked at gross income for movies from box office sales. And what about other sources of viewing? Is it just about money for popularity? Is there something else? How do you define popular? And so there's a lot of questions that come up when we're looking at data and you're actually imposing quite a bit of decision-making and uh, prioritization through this process of analyzing it. And so, we, so here's a few different um, statements that you can make based on the data that we saw. Here are a few statements, and we're just gonna look at two of these and break them down based on scientific certainty. Uh, but you can state that Gone with the Wind is clearly the most popular movie because of it has the highest domestic income once adjusted for inflation. You could also say the most popular t a movie of all time is actually Star Wars because while it made a little bit less than Gone with the Wind, uh, it made that over a much shorter period of time. And you could also say that uh, the most popular movie of all time is Totoro because it's actually been viewed the most in my household by my kids. Um, and, and my household's pretty average. Um, and so I, I'm gonna extrapolate that observation to just the general pop, pop, public and what popularity is. Another possible statement would be it's not possible to determine popularity from this given data set because we're just looking at um, box office purchases and not the number of viewings per film. Um, and so maybe we need to also look at uh, DVD and VHS sales for a movie as well. And do we weigh those equally with box office ticket numbers? A uh, movie that I buy, I'm gonna watch a lot more than one that I just view once at a movie theater. So using this data and, and evaluating, you can come to a lot of different conclusions. Um, and let's evaluate just a couple of these. Uh, let's look at A. So the most popular movie of all time is Gone with the Wind because it is the highest grossing movie after adjusting for inflation, earning over $1.8 billion in adjusted gross income. This means that popularity is based on adjusted gross income. So our amount of evidence, um, yeah, it's, it's okay. Um, we have one piece of evidence, right? Um, the adjusted gross income. So it's, it's kind of low in that regard. Our strength of evidence is, um, we could say it, it, it doesn't have any loopholes. We've adjusted for income inflation, um, but it's just one line of evidence, right? It's just looking at box office numbers that are um, adjusted. So now is this objective or subjective? Well, the piece of information is very objective, but our choice to rely on it is more on the subjective side. And so that piece is kind of a question mark. And so I'm not sure where that puts us necessarily in certainty. It kind of just depends on how you view the objectivity of this statement. Uh, but it definitely doesn't put us in the, the law area at all <laughs> on certainty. So let's look at C, the most popular movie of all time is Totoro because it has been viewed more than any other movie in my household and my household is fairly average and so we can extrapolate that to general popularity. 
so looking at the amount of evidence here, it is very low. It's one observation, the observation of my household. The strength of evidence is also very low because uh, it's, it's not extremely related. Like one household is not representative of all households. And it's very subjective as well because it is making the claim, it is making the, the, the decision that my household is average, which I think is very much up for debate. And so we would say that this is very low on our certainty scale. It's just an observation of one household. Now that we've discussed how to evaluate if something is scientific and how to break apart and evaluate a scientific claim or argument, I'd like to take what we've been learning about this and now apply it to how we craft a scientific argument um, that is strong and easy for the reader to critically evaluate. Um, so to do this, we expect scientific writing in general to follow um, the same pattern, to make it easy for people to read, digest, and critically evaluate. And so the most important piece of this is that you make a statement or claim or present an idea and then follow it with evidence. It's kind of like telling the punchline of a joke first, and that makes for terrible joke telling. It might even make for terrible writing in general. But from a scientific writing perspective, we want to be very upfront and transparent about here is the idea. Here is my claim. I'm now going to give you evidence for that claim to evaluate. Rather than build up a pile of evidence and say, ta-da, here is my scientific claim. So start with a claim, follow with evidence. That'll make your writing very clear and easy to evaluate. Now, that evidence must clearly support the claim, and the best way to communicate that is by explaining the connection really explicitly. And we call this scientific reasoning. It connects the evidence to the claim clearly with a scientific um, logic or reasoning for ideas. And this might be something that you learn about in our class, and you're like, well, I have this evidence, and I have this idea, and this thing I learned about connects the two. Uh, third, the level of certainty in the evidence should be transparently communicated. We don't hide whether or not we have a lot or a little evidence. We want to be very, very transparent and clear that the scientific idea is really just based on an observation or it's based on a series of observations or it's based on a series of observations and different lines of experimentation. Fourth, statements or arguments uh, must be open to critical peer review by the scientific community. Uh, a scientific argument needs to be presented to the scientific community to be confirmed, to, to be critically evaluated, to be discussed, and to be improved upon. Um, and so the, those are kind of the pieces that really make up scientific writing. Uh, and this is a journey for your entire career to improve and get better at writing uh, in a scientific manner. Um, and so I, I think especially when beginning, it's nice to have a formula for doing this, um, just to get comfortable with this pattern. Um, and there's a couple ways you can think about it. When crafting a scientific argument, you can really start with a scientific idea and expectations and then the observations. And those observations are really that evidence for that idea and that reasoning together. Another way to do this is um, what we call claim evidence reasoning, where you, you state a claim and then you provide the evidence for that claim. And the claim's really just a scientific idea. And then you connect them with reasoning. You say, my evidence supports this claim because blah. And that creates a scientific argument. And so these are kind of stylistic ideas on how to structure writing a, a scientific claim. Uh, so if you uh, are already familiar with CER format, great. And if it's brand new to you, there's a great uh, video on Bozeman Science breaking down claim evidence and reasoning formatting in, a, um, uh, in scientific writing that I recommend watching. And really, when we're, when we're using CER format, which is always an option in this class, if you have another style that works well and does the same thing, please, by all means, use it. Um, and I present this just as a, a, a format for those learning, um, introductory learners uh, for the scientific writing. 
So our claim is always going to be a statement about the results of an investigation. So I might make the claim that hydrogen or crystal healing uh, cures cancer. Then I'm going to follow it with evidence, and that's going to be scientific data used to support the claim. In the double-blind study performed on 70,000 participants uh, with X on a placebo and X using crystals uh, to heal, accentuate their treatment plan, we see that 75% of the, the, the patients using crystals um, went into remission. Something like that. It would cite studies and it would show the lines of evidence that actually support that claim. And then reasoning is going to tie the claim and the evidence together. You can see a decrease in or an increase in cancer remission is going to support the claim that it is a, a, a strong cancer therapy. Making this up off the top of my head. And this is the order you would do them in. And they don't have to be individual sentences. They could be all together in one sentence or in a couple of sentences. The idea is that you're hitting each of these different ideas. So let's look at an example. So I'm taking one of our statements about popular movies. The most popular movie of all time is Gone with the Wind. So that in blue, that first phrase is my claim. I'm making the claim that the most popular movie is Gone with the Wind. Now I'm gonna follow it with evidence. So my evidence is because it was the highest domestic grossing movie after adjusting for inflation, earning over $1.8 billion in adjusted gross income. I'm citing something very specific here um, as my evidence. I'm saying it has made the most money once you adjust for inflation. And that is my evidence. Then I'm going to link this with my scientific reasoning. Here in green, the highest earning movie indicates a large number of viewings and therefore popularity. So this is, this is kind of my opinion almost here. I'm saying that I'm choosing to rely on box office numbers to demonstrate popularity and that that is the most important thing to being a popular movie. And that's why my evidence supports my claim. Sometimes your scientific reasoning component of an argument will seem really obvious, um, but it's not necessarily obvious to all readers. And even when it feels very obvious, we have to state that obvious that obvious bit of the, the argument, right? To clearly be like, these go together and it should be obvious that they go together and I'm stating it for you. And so that's one way to craft a um, argument. Now let's say that you disagree with me. Gone with the Wind is most definitely not the most popular movie of all time. It is clearly Star Wars. Um, then, what you would need to do, or it's clearly Totoro, <laughs> is respond. And responding is more than just saying, uh-uh, I disagree. It needs to also follow that same scientific argument format. Because to disagree with a scientific argument, you must have evidence behind it. And so using the CRE format will work just as well for a response as for an initial scientific claim. Uh, and so let's try doing that um, using CER format to respond to this movie claim that Gone with the Wind is the most popular one. So respond that it's not. Take a pause on the video, try this yourself, and then I'll demonstrate my response. So hopefully you've had a moment to uh, practice writing out a response using CER format for this. I'm gonna give you an example. Yours probably looks different. Um, we all have different ideas about what may or may not be a good response to this statement. So I'm gonna make the claim that uh, Gone with the Wind is not the most popular movie. Or that we don't know it's the most popular movie. Now, my evidence for this is going to be um, something about this statement that um, is forgotten. So I'm going to cite as my, state, my evidence that this statement only takes into account box office sales, and it does not account for home, uh, home viewings of the movie. So my evidence will be box office sales,
to not account for home viewings of a movie. My reasoning then is going to link these two. What does the home viewings of a movie have to do with popularity? And it's going to be popularity should be defined as the number of viewings rather than the number of viewings in a movie theater. So my strategy here is to attack the way the scientific reasoning that popularity is connected with uh, box office earnings. Um, and so I'm going to say that popularity should be based on total viewings. That means that we need to consider the sales of home movies or movies at home. So DVD sales and VHS sales and streaming sales at a higher number than box office sales, because if they are rewatchable, then we have a higher number of viewings and so we should weight that more importantly and so i would then probably go into hopefully having a study that says we know that dvd and vhs sales for star wars far exceeded that of gone with the wind therefore each of those purchases reflects a greater number of viewings than one box office purchase so we should weight that at x percentage and then I could build an argument in a paper off of that. This leads to another testable idea, right? We can go test this idea of well, what are the numbers for home video purchases? What, what information does that bring into this question of what is the most popular movie of all time? And now that I've kind of done this in three separate pieces, I would then bring this together into like one or two sentences that, that was easier to read. So in this class, we're going to really rely on these scientific communication skills a lot. You're going to use them in your lab reports. Uh, Post-lab questions will oftentimes need to be formatted where you're making a statement or a claim. You're providing evidence and you're connecting the two with reasoning. Um, and that's a, a very common place that you'll get practice with these skills again and again. But you'll also have practice on these in um, any evaluations where we're looking at short answer questions, things that come on exams or in problem sets that we'll be doing um, with the class. And this is also a really great way to actually formulate responses within class discussions online as well. Um, when we are not in person together, it's harder to really convey our true meaning without facial expressions and tone um, that we usually rely on. And so creating a structure to an online discussion that is very, um, claim evidence reasoning based will make it easier to communicate our ideas clearly and effectively. 